I'm not Adit. Um, Adit couldn't be here, unfortunately, so I will be moderating this panel. But um, my name is Nina Polshkova. I'm a software engineer at Solo on the Glue platform team. Um, and I've worked a little bit on the Ambient project in Istio, and I was actually a 127 shadow for the enhancements uh, for the 127 release. But um, let's introduce our panelists. So uh, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves first and tell me what you work on and uh, say your favorite thing about Amsterdam. So Yuval, do you want to start? Sure, I'm a... Oh, I don't think it's on, is it? Can you hear me? Okay, okay. Uh, I'm Yuval Kohavi. I'm the chief architect at Solo.io. Uh, currently, I'm working on uh, data path optimizations for the uh, Zetown component. And uh, things I like at Amsterdam, definitely Stroop waffles. <laughs> Very tasty. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eric Van Arman. I'm a senior software engineer at IBM, and I work in the Istio community. I am a member of the technical oversight committee. Um, I'm also the work group lead for the test and release work group, and I also do a lot of doc maintenance as well, uh, PR approvals. Um, I guess I always say when I go places, I try the beer, whether it's good or bad, and I actually found some, some, some really good beer, and I have to admit, I found a really good limoncello. Ooh. <laughs> so. Hey, I'm John Howard. I'm a software engineer at Google. I've been working at Istio for about four years now on the technical oversight committee and various other things. Uh, in Amsterdam, I've enjoyed just walking around the city. It's, you know, very nice, walkable city. Hey, I'm Keith Maddox. I'm an engineering lead at Microsoft, uh, working on service mesh in, in Istio. Um, my focus right now is on uh, some ACO ambient stuff as well as this new safe mode thing that maybe you'll hear about eventually. Um, my favorite thing about Amsterdam is probably the bikes. Love seeing all the biking uh, around the city. So yeah, it's been great. For sure. Um, and then one more uh, icebreaker. So I want everyone to answer what is their least favorite thing? What's the one thing that they hate about service mesh? Who wants to start? <laughs> an itzio specific one i can't pronounce it i would say itzio instead of um, it's it's to you <laughs> whatever it is Very true i'll go ahead um my, my least favorite thing about service mesh is probably all the crds <laughs> uh, my least favorite thing is probably that we you know we realize once you stick a proxy in between all traffic there's a lot of things you can do, and so there's a lot of things we try and do, and there's a lot of things you need to understand that we want to do, and just everything can go wrong when you're capturing 100% of traffic and trying to do things to it. Well, I was going to say I have the same problem with ITSEO when I try to type it on <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, it doesn't come off my fingertips the same way, um, so that's one. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll pick on the you know the pipeline stuff since i'm the test and release kind of guy um it always seems that uh, there, there's something that wants to break um there, there's something in the pipeline we haven't used for a while and um we, we want to go use it and then you know things just don't work like we want so not necessarily istio related but at least istio build related yeah definitely um so the way this is going to work is i have some pre-prepared questions that i'm going to ask and then we're going to open it up for the audience so start thinking of questions you want to ask the panelists so um, the way the questions are going to work is we're going to start with pretty mild, easy softballs and then move up in spice. <laughs> um, so the first question is just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, everyone understands the sidecar architecture for service meshes, um, but what's this new sidecarless architecture I've been hearing a lot about? Does anyone want to start? Yeah, so um, the main difference with sidecar and uh, sidecar is, is essentially that the workloads don't need a sidecar attached to them, and that has the consequence. You don't need injection, you don't need any containers. And we do this by creating a node proxy that's responsible for all the layer four and security, and separating out the layer seven to a separate component. We call that the waypoint. Uh, that's kind of my basic overview. Uh, it has all sorts of advantages, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about, we'll get to. Yeah, anyone else want to add to that? Uh, the way I like to think about uh, sidecarless is less headache to operate. Um, when you have a sidecar next to your application, it can be really challenging to 
coordinate restarts uh, of all the applications when you do upgrades. Uh, it can be difficult to uh, debug. It's right in the path of your application developers monitoring their own and owning their own services. Uh, Sacralis as an architecture allows that all of that complexity in theory to be uh, pushed down and managed by someone other than your, uh, other than you perhaps, other than an application developer, um, and just is generally going to, you know, in, again, in theory, uh, less headache for the people who are providing value for your business. Great. Um, okay, well, we can move on to the next one. Um, it's kind of related. So why the hell does everyone, anyone actually want a sidecarless service mesh? Like, what are the benefits? Like, we, we kind of touched on it, but... Yeah, I mean, it was kind of touched on, but it's really about taking the cost associated with the service mesh that's been traditionally associated with the service mesh, but that's actually not inherent to a service mesh, but rather the existing implementations based on sidecars. Retaining all the value that we have of service mesh, but removing that cost, um, you know, whether that's resource overhead, uh, complexity shoved onto the application, uh, you know, pod owners and whatnot, or all these life cycle issues, upgrades, uh, management, et cetera. So. Yeah, I was going to say basically the same thing. The, the, the resource usage is obviously a big thing. Um, the, 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 um, the ability to not have to restart your, your, pod, your pod every time you uh, want to update a proxy is, is another big one. Um, and I'm hoping performance will be a, another thing that uh, we'll find out is, is much better as well. Yeah, I was going to kind of touch on what you said. We're essentially decoupling, tru truly decoupling the application and the platform. So we separate the life cycles. So I think that's kind of the key. Uh, here. Anything else you want to add? Okay, let's move on. So eBPF, hot topic. <laughs> um, so doesn't eBPF solve a lot of service mesh problems? It actually also solve all your personal problems. <laughs> really? I didn't know that. <laughs> Uh, so, so, well, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, what is eBPF? Can we give so, it? So, yeah, eBPF is a technology that essentially allows you to extend the Linux kernel and ask it to do custom behavior. It, uh, it is a bit overhyped, I would say. Uh, what it does, it is lets you customize the kernel at a certain hook point. So the kernel has to be aware of it. You can't just insert eBPF program that would change the logic arbitrarily. So it has very well-defined semantics, and it can definitely help, uh, but it doesn't solve all our problems. Uh, specifically, the harder one th to solve are the L7 layers that are, depending on the protocol, hard to impossible uh, to do interesting stuff with eBPF. Yeah, the way I view it is a bit like how I view cryptocurrency or WASM or AI. You know, once it's new, we have all these conferences where everyone's talking about it all the time, applying it to everything. And it's fun to talk about, it's great. But once it matures, a lot of those use cases go away. And what remains is a few cases where it's actually extremely valuable, right? AI is probably overhyped, but it's very useful in some cases. Maybe not blockchain, but you know, the rest uh, <laughs> will provide some use cases. So there are areas where eBPF is, is great. Um, you know, we. I've actually started using it in some areas of Istio in some limited manner. Um, but it is, you know, the, those places are fewer than is presented in conferences like these when we're all, uh, you know, trying to talk about the next big thing. I think another aspect of eBPF that I think is important to keep in mind is that a lot of the performance benefits and things that you see from eBPF being used in software uh, comes from being able to do operations in the Linux kernel itself instead of crossing into user space. That means, though, when you have to cross into user space for anything, some of those performance benefits kind of go, go away, right? Um, and so it's important to, to remember that. Uh, the Linux kernel is, is fantastic. It's done so much in its, in its time in VC all over our industry. Um, but there are some limits, and those limits are also the limits of eBPF. And so when you have to cross in user space to do something like, you know, something layer 7 or TLS, something like that, um, then you really start to um, hit the viability limits of where eBPF can actually be useful. Yeah, so are there any specific examples where it can be useful, like, uh, that you've seen? And, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, basically, eBPF can lay, make Linux aware of your topology, right? So we can definitely optimize stuff with eBPF 
uh, save traversals through the network traffic, um, you know, save so network stack, save, you know, um, having, you know, data reach from one pod to another pod. Uh, because we know our intent, we could use eBPF to express it in a, and optimize the current behavior, um, but it's not a panacea. So we definitely plan to use it to, for optimizations, internal network traffic, in observability, um, security even. Um, this is definitely a lot of valid use cases. Yeah, so security is one that a lot of people bring up. Um, are, are like, how specifically can eBPF be used um, for security in like a service mesh scenario? Um, anybody else, or should I? Yeah, I can take this. Uh, I think there's a lot of areas where it can be applied, and you see, you know, a few products that are kind of inspecting, uh, you know, all the syscalls in the system and auditing that and analyzing it, uh, which is not really something that's associated with service mesh typically. Um, within service mesh, the foundation of security is typically MTLS, right? That's what brings a lot of people to service mesh in the first place. That's kind of the foundation of how all authorization policies, uh, you know, all the security benefits uh, Istio and other service meshes bring, uh, which is something that's not actually implemented in the kernel barring some minor things. <laughs> uh, practically, it's not something that can be done in eBPF, right? And so when we want to enforce the security aspects of a service mesh, typically we're not going to be able to do that purely in the kernel or in eBPF. Yeah, that actually leads nicely to our, fault, our next question. Um, what is MTLS anyway? And why is it important in a service mesh context? Like, why do people care? So I want to first start uh, by asking all of you, who's heard of MTLS in this room? Lots of people, great, put your hands down. Who here is required to have MTLS by their organization or some regulation? Also a good bit of people, right? Um, and the reason for that is because MTLS is what is responsible, it's, it's the, the protocol for encrypting traffic on the wire between two things. You've got two computers of some sort, maybe they're VMs, maybe they're Kubernetes pods, and they need to talk across a network, something needs to encrypt that. Um, and the M means that it's mutually uh, encrypted. So the, uh, not only does the client, the thing sending the request, check the identity of the server, the server also has the opportunity to, to detect the, the identity of the client and say only certain people can, can talk to me. Uh, and again, it creates this encrypted, this encrypted tunnel. Um, the you know, MTLS built off of the, the regular TLS that many of you might be familiar with, with uh, your ingress gateways or your edge gateways, you know, with well, this also called SSL. Um, but uh, the M part, the mutual part, actually gives you a lot of power um, for more advanced use cases because identity uh, is mutually authenticated. And I'll just add that it's authenticated in a cryptographic way that's impossible to forge and um, does not have any eventual consistency problems. Definitely. And uh, so the talk covers sidecar, sidecarless, and proxyless, right? So do all three of those support MTLS in like different service meshes? Do they support them the same? Like, um, does anyone want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, so all, all three of these are based on the same uh, secure MTLS transport. Um, like it, I think I mentioned earlier, this is really the foundation of Istio security. And, uh, you know, we offer that security in all our data plane modes. Um, the details are slightly different, although for the MTLS part, they're, they're very similar uh, on the security models. If you're interested, uh, we gave a talk on Tuesday. I talked a whole 30 minutes specifically comparing the security properties of Sidecar versus Ambient. Um, so I guess check that out afterwards if you're interested in learning more. Yeah, anything else anyone wants to add? No? Okay, well, we're gonna open it for questions from the audience now. Um, so if you have a question, there's mics in the middle. Um, so feel free to come up and ask. Um, otherwise, I will have to result, uh, resort to our backup questions, which aren't as spicy as things that you can ask. So. Oh, our first question. Hi. Uh, the waypoint proxies sound like a bit like just another layer of proxying is going to fix all our problems. Um, and I'm wondering, do you see that uh, the, the 
a waypoint functionality, the L7 um, stuff, authorization policies and so on, move into middlewares eventually as a performance improvement? Or is that a route that you think service meshes and Istio is never going to take? With a fallback to-, to Follow-up follow question. Um, when you say middleware, what uh, what are you describing? Like, uh, what do you mean sorry, by middleware? Like if you have like a Flask or Django or like some uh, um, PHP, whether like these authorization policies and L7 functionalities on the receiving side, on the listener side, would eventually uh, get like XTS compatibility in every uh, language, and whether that's something that that you think is worth working towards, or whether we should keep everything in a, in a proxy or a sidecar. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so in Istio, we do actually support. It's it's much less known than the sidecar or the new ambient mode, but what we call proxyless gRPC, which is essentially what you described. We, we take the gRPC client and server um, that some of you may be familiar with, and we add XDS support uh, so that it can be dynamically programmed by the Istio control plane and enforce Istio policies, routing rules, etc. cetera. Um, the, the typical use case for that, as opposed to the other architectures, is that you're willing to take a little bit of pain and do a little bit more work for ultra high performance, right? Basically no overhead. Um, now, does that replace the waypoint proxy by doing it on the server side? To some extent it can. Um, the thing that's important to realize though is that the waypoint proxy is doing both um, things that were traditionally done by clients in the sidecar architecture and things that were done by the server in the sidecar architecture. So things like routing, but also things like authorization policy. So even if you put a lot of logic in your service, whether that's through gRPC or you know you just write the code yourself, you can't really do load balancing on the server side application, right? You've already picked the server you're going to go to. You can't do routing, canary rollouts, et cetera. Uh, whereas by the waypoint being abstracted away from the uh, service application, you are able to do those things. So you could replace the waypoint architecture uh, with smart clients and smart services. Uh, which is a bit like the proxy list GRPC or even sidecar option. Uh, those are things that we still expect to support in addition to ambient, right? It's not an either or situation. Uh, it's more about what use cases are, you know, you need and what trade-offs you're willing to make. Now, of course, ambient's kind of the new thing, so we talk about it a lot, but that doesn't mean that it's the only thing and that we're going to remove, you know, everything else. Any other questions come up? Hello. Um, some of the folks of Linkerd as well, uh, they, they were doing another talk and they were talking about um, the benefits and the weights of uh, sidecarless. Uh, and they generally, t like they, they, uh, one of the, the pain points of like sidecarless uh, is more like when it comes to, oh, you still have to maintain an L7 proxy to do L7 stuff. Uh, generally you could do that like only one proxy per node, well, that's, that's an advantage to then not hold so much, uh, like to not spin up so many pods of like Envoy and hold so much memory. But that's a single point of failure as well, right? Like if you, if that proxy goes down, you lose the whole node, right? Uh, do, you, do you guys have opinions on that? Could you expand on it? I can. Uh, yeah, my opinion, you already have a single point of failure on the node, that's the Linux kernel, right? But you trust it and it proved itself over the years and that's what we're aiming for with Z-Tunnel, right? We're, it's written in Rust, memory safe language and uh, it is becoming critical infrastructure. My mental model for Z-Tunnel that it's kind of becoming part of the Linux network stack. And our goal is to make it so reliable uh, so it wouldn't crash, just like Linux today didn't crash but 20 years ago. It had plenty of crashes, so. Yeah, to expand on that too is, you know, when you talk to other folks, they're comparing sidecars to, there's more than one implementation of a non-sidecar based service mesh, right? And in Istio, we've been very, very cautious about where we put what functionality. So it, it's not reasonable, I think, to say that we're going to take some gigantic piece of software and stick it on the node, single point of failure, and it's never gonna have bugs because we tried really hard, right? But what is reasonable is say, we're going to do one very small thing and we're gonna do it very well and we're gonna be highly focused, not have feature creep. We're going to move that complexity somewhere else, right? Which is what we did in Z-Tunnel. 
So when, basically the only functionality of ZTunnel is just to enforce the MTLS, which we've talked about plenty before, and that's about it. So it's very small and very focused, and that's why we're confident that we can, one, keep the overhead and resource consumption, et cetera, low, but also keep it stable and uh, you know, reduce the likelihood that we hit the single point of failure, right? Thank you, Ray. There's a question in the back. Uh, hi, hi. Uh, do you consider, in terms of performance, uh, not pushing everything into kernel, into kernel ring, but using DPDK, like I know, Calico VPP, and uh, putting the filtering and uh, termination stuff into entire uh, network interface? I, I think the question was, like, have we thought about offloading some of the work that yeah, ZTunnel does? Yeah, with DPDK. DPDK. Uh. <laughs> and so, yeah, DPDK is basically a way, if correct me if I'm wrong, to pass through traffic from the network card to user mode, kind of skipping over the kernel. Uh, currently, we were focused on eBPF um, in terms of you know, optimization of the data path. Um, I wouldn't rule out DPDK, but it's not something we're currently looking at. Uh, so, uh, mine is, uh, I, I will try to be a bit spicy. So, <laughs> uh, eBPF is overhyped and uh, AI and also uh, crypto and all. <laughs> Uh, I, I would like to know from you, uh, besides, of course, proxyless, what are the big thing that you think is the next thing for ser service mesh or killer feature from you? Uh, I think the next step for service mesh is to learn how to be boring. Um, I know that's not quite as spicy as you might have been um, expecting, but for a long time, service mesh has been this thing. You've got conferences on conferences and talks about it. Um, kind of to what you've always saying before, for something like ZTunnel or uh, Istio as a whole to become critical infrastructure that you can depend on like the Linux kernel, it's going to have to learn how to be boring. Um, and sometimes that means you know, rejecting uh, the new and shiny thing and new and shiny features and focusing on being uh, production ready, on being uh, enterprise ready. And Istio has, done a, you know, has a remarkable track record being used in some of the largest organizations out there. Um, let's take that a step further and uh, learn how to be boring. Yeah, I was gonna, gonna sort of add to that. You know, besides being boring, just something that it's, it's there and does its job and people just don't have to worry about it. I think in the back. Yep. Hello. Um, so I wasn't familiar with ZTunnel, so I quickly looked it up and understood it would most likely be replacing Envoy. Um, or maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong. But um, does that mean, um, like, will we still be able to, like, extend Z tunnel with WASM, or is there like going to be a solution for that? Because I know currently the for extending STO, like you can write WASM modules. Um. Uh, yeah, so in some ways, it's it's not really replacing Envoy. If you're familiar with the architecture, we also have a waypoint proxy that is optional on a kind of per service counter namespace basis. That is still an Envoy and does all the functionality that Istio sidecars do today, including WASM, including extensibility, et cetera. But the ZTunnel itself is not likely to have that extensibility, right? Like I mentioned before, the ZTunnel is very, very tightly focused. Its only job really is to do the encryption uh, and authentication and authorization on the node level. And we intentionally have kept it small and avoided adding things like WASM, which can cause kind of questionable um, or not necessarily questionable, but unreliable, inconsistent uh, performance attributes. You know, if we start doing a lot of complex processing on the node, it becomes a higher attack surface. It uses more resources, which it's really hard to scale a daemon set, by the way. Um, and so we move all that logic out into a waypoint proxy, which is just a standalone deployment or even just some opaque service. And that's where we put all the rich functionality of the service mesh. So I can scale up, it can scale down, et cetera, independently. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, I guess the one thing I would have added to that was um, it also then only impacts the, the waypoint proxy will only impact that particular application. It's not going to impact everybody. Um, so uh, when assigning resources, so CPU and memory to sidecars, this was always a huge headache and over-provisioning was really easy. Um, with the uh, waypoint proxies, this seems to be a lot improved, but um, um, will we reach someday a point where we just say, is to figure the right size out, uh, like multi-dimensional auto scaling or something like that? So that's really the right amount always. <laughs> so the waypoints, you can think of them as a regular deployment and you could apply to them things like the horizontal pod auto scaler or you know, any other scaling mechanism you want. Uh, that's part of the, the why this architecture is so powerful. But don't I get a lot of hops between nodes then? You'll get a hop between Z tunnel to waypoint and waypoint to Z tunnel. Um, but the main important thing to remember here is that you're only getting one L7 hope. And L7, where all the features are, that's where all the kind of most of the latency is spent. So by decreasing, instead of two L7 hops of, you know, client sidecar and, seven, and server sidecar to one L7 hop, you'll get a similar performance characteristics, even though you're going through more proxies. Uh, can I use horizontal autoscalers with it? With waypoints, yes. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, I have a basic, maybe basic question, I don't know. Uh, one of the uh, pain on the sidecar is that uh, if for any reason you need to uh, change the CA root of your proxy and the things, it is a pain uh, with the uh, working cluster. How does it change in the new architecture with the uh, no. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so anytime you need to change your CA route in just about any system, it's, there's going to be a level of pain, um, unfortunately. Where I think uh, Waypoint or the ambient architecture helps at least a little bit, uh, is the fact that it's no longer in an N squared kind of scenario. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, in a sidecar model, you had a, you know, every sidecar has to know generally about every sidecar. Um, and so when you're cha propagating changes out, that can take a long time and make the CA uh, rotation process a bit longer and a bit more, um, a bit more dangerous. Um, even though, yeah, rotating your CA is something you should always be careful with, uh, I think that with Ambient, because uh, now you just have kind of a, you know, you're always going to have um, less nodes than pods. There's less things to distribute that new route to. Um, and, you know, potentially you're talking about a, long, a, a shorter period of time. So there's even maybe some optimizations in your process that you can make to, to you know, propagate that new route train of trust. If I may, may I know uh, where the certificates are located that change this behavior in the new? Um, so with, and someone else can hop in here if they, if they want, but uh, with, with Ambient, the certificates are going to be on the Z tunnel. Um, and with, whereas with the sidecar option, um, the sidecar way, they were on every single sidecar. So there are more places that the Istio control plane had to send the certificates, whereas now uh, it's, there are fewer. And I guess the other thing I, I might add, at least I think this is the way it works, um, John can probably correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the number of certificates you have to have becomes less because in the Z-Tunnel case, you're only worrying about the, the certificates for those things on that node, um, whereas with um, the sidecar, you end up having to know about the certificates, as you mentioned, for you know, pretty much the whole mesh unless you have it, you know, scoped down. All right, and then I think a uh, question in the back, and this will be our last question from the audience. How will, we, how will you make the Z tunnel highly available per node? I mean, you have a daemon set that you can't update without downtime, and there is just one uh, pod per node. So how are you going to address that? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is where eBPF does solve all our problems. And uh, <laughs> we can actually, uh, 
we, we we're doing some research here uh, about using eBPF to slowly drain a single Z tunnel uh, as you upgrade. Basically, you have two demons set deployed at the same time. Uh, with eBPF, we'll implement dragging mechanism where old connections go to the old Z tunnel and new connections go to the new Z tunnel. And after you know drain period, you can remove the old demon set. Okay, well, um, we'll move on to um, one more question um, from the slides. So we talked about this briefly, but what's the difference between sidecarless and proxyless? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I briefly mentioned this, so I'll expand on it a bit. Um, we should probably stop calling things less and <laughs> talk about more about what they are. And, and what it really is for proxyless is putting more uh, dynamic logic in applications, in, in particular, gRPC. Um, and what this means is that, you know, if you use gRPC today without this proxy list feature, uh, you would, you know, put some options in and say, I want uh, to route my service here. I want to use this, connect this option, this option, this option. But it's not dynamic like we have a service mesh, right? We, you can't apply a virtual service and suddenly have your gRPC applications do it or authorization policy, et cetera. Um, so what proxy list is, is enabling that, right? We use the same XDS, which is the protocol used between Envoy and Istio to get configuration. The same protocol is used by gRPC as well now. And so we can dynamically configure it to do uh, many things that Envoy can do. Not quite everything, but a lot of things. And the reason someone may want to do that is performance. That's basically it, right? It's not as seamless as Envoy. We don't have auto injection that automatically configures it and your application doesn't know about it, right? They actually go and change their application code and say, I want to use the XDS options in gRPC. But in return, they get basically the highest performance of any service mesh can offer, right? The overhead is effectively zero. So if you have a use case where that's all you care about is I must have no overhead, uh, it's really one of the only options. Awesome. Anyone else want to add? Yep. Yeah, I, I was going to basically sort of say the same thing. Um, you, you're always giving up something for something else. And you know, one of the, the things I always tell people about service mesh um, is it takes the application developer out of the picture. I mean, they typically, you know, at least in my mind, they don't really have to do anything. It's up to the platform engineer to have to worry about it. Um, and in this case, they're taking away that benefit, at least what I consider a benefit, and pushing a little bit back on them. But the, other, the, you know, the gain there is the performance. Yeah, to try to hopefully like add some more color to this. Um, who here has used Java Spring Boot? Who, yeah, who's used something like uh, like the .NET framework, right? So th these are all ecosystems and, and libraries that you're using to build your applications. Um, but the issue is in a service mesh deployment, uh, you want to be able to use different languages. And there's no guarantee that something like Spring Boot can talk to .NET Core, can talk to Django, can talk to Node, and have all that re-implemented in different places. So gRPC is the protocol that all the different libraries can standardize on. And then when you fire up gRPC clients, they all know how to do this XDS dance um, and do the MTLS and all the dynamic stuff by talking to Istio control plane. Uh, so really what proxyless is, is you know, putting stuff back in the hands of the application developer, like Eric said, um, whereas with sidecarless, you're just, remo you're just uh, removing the sidecar and putting the proxy somewhere else. Yeah, great. Um, I think we have time for one last question. So it's more of a crystal ball question and I want everyone to answer it. Um, so where do you see service mesh in 18 months? Who wants to start, John? Uh, yeah, I can take this. I think it's largely going away. And what I mean by that is not that we're going to, you know, cancel Istio or <laughs> cancel service mesh, but that we won't need to think about it. We won't need to talk about it. It would just be there, right? Which is really the origin of the ambient word, right? Like you shouldn't have to go say, okay, I want all these cool functionalities of a service mesh, so I'm gonna go deploy Istio and onboard my applications and do all this stuff, right? You should just be able to start a Kubernetes cluster and you have TLS, you have MTLS even. And if I wanna do a routing rule, I just apply an HTTP route or a virtual service and I get routing. If I wanna enforce authorization policies that are beyond what network policy offers, I just apply the authorization policy and it works, right? This is how a lot of things in Kubernetes work today, like network policy, for example. It's just an API. You don't worry about how it's implemented. And I think that that's where, hopefully, service mesh is going. 
You will? Um, yeah, I was going to say something very similar. I mean, today when you saw a Kubernetes cluster, the first thing you install is a CNI. And I think the, the second thing you would install would be a service mesh, just because it'd be so prevalent. And to add to John's point, uh, after what I think will happen is that everybody will standardize on a service mesh, you could also leverage the identity it provides you as an application developer. Because all of a sudden, the service mesh can provide you an identity that you can trust uh, to the application itself. And you could use it to kind of leverage those features and save you some time writing your applications. You have one less concern to worry about. Um, well, I, I, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I sort of agree with John's idea. Um, I don't know if we'll get there in 18 months, <laughs> um, but I do hope we get there at, at, at some point. Um, you know, 18 months from now, um, I, th I, th I think we'll, we'll we'll have a better understanding, at least on, on Istio service mesh, does this sidecarless, does this ambient mode um, really play out? Um, I'm really kind of, you know, waiting to see what people can, you know, try it, get it out, you know, and, and let us know how it works. Um, and we'll see how, how things change. Um, but again, I think there's a lot of stuff. As you mentioned, we, we come to these conferences um, and there's always the new shiny thing. Um, I'm, I don't know what that shiny thing's gonna be in 18 months, but I do think there's probably gonna be a shiny thing, um, which is gonna, you know, that's why I don't think we're gonna be there in 18 months because um, we, we do have a, a winding path. Um, and I hope, at least from an issue standpoint, it'll be ambient mode. Um, and people will be able to use it, and it will make things simpler, less complex, less costly, um, and hopefully they don't have to debug as many issues as sometimes they have to debug. Where do I see service mesh in 18 months? Uh, worth it is what I uh, is the best way I can think and summarize. I agree with everything everybody has, has said. Um, I was on another one of these panels, I think, in, in, in Detroit, and someone had a question about the total cost of ownership of service mesh. Um, it's way too high. Uh, in, in current day, it's way too high for our users. And in 18 months, I want to see that, if not, it's not gonna, never going to be eliminated, but I want that to see, the, see that severely cut down so that service mesh will be worth it. Yeah. Well, that's uh, the end of our panel. Thank you for sticking around, and thank 